Hello, YouTubers, friends, compatriots, bootlickers, shills, dust, lacers, peasants, vassals, minions. Welcome. I'm a useful idiot. And uh, today I want to talk about Israel again. And as promised, I'm going to do the prequel to my previous video about segregation and racism, institutional racism, in the state of Israel. And uh, I tried to make myself clear in that video that uh, there's certainly a lot more uh, vo uh, volatile and inflammatory uh, commentators out there about Zionism and Israel and um and the like uh, out there than me. I try to be uh, somewhat of a voice of moderation, but there's issues in Israel that I, I cannot ignore. And as I always say, I judge uh, Israel uh, on the same level playing field as I judge all other nations. And uh, unfortunately, like most nations, they fail miserably. And um, it, uh, it's funny that uh, even my 84 year old mother worries about me knowing that I post videos about Israel so we live in that kind of era and uh, inevitably when you post videos about Israel you lose subscribers it's very predictable and it's very unfortunate like I say in spite of the fact that I try to be very objective and uh, try and uh, get rid of the fear mongering and the profiling and the, uh, and the scare tactics and just get to the the facts uh, so Anyway, uh, the fact that I lose subscribers just for bringing it up uh, only reinforces my uh, perspective and my views and that I'm doing the right thing. And um, the other thing I want to add is that uh, I've read a lot of editorials out there and I've seen uh, uh, pundits uh, in the media uh, and cable and on the Internet and all discussing about uh, the so-called spread of anti-Semitism and um, the reactionary and, and, and the uh, all the critiques and, and all the uh, uh, boiling, uh, seething uh, emotions underneath the surface out there that come out uh, when we have an event like this uh, slaughter in Gaza. And um, so there's a lot of angry voices out there, especially in the Internet, uh, talking about uh, uh, Israel. And um, the, the calls for moderation are, are I, I take in stride because uh, I notice uh, a lot of times when there's a lot of Islamophobia, and fear mongering and uh, profiling um, and, and discussion of uh, Islamophobia and, and Arabs and, and uh, the demonizing of uh, Muslims, uh, there doesn't seem to be quite the calls for moderation. So I, I try to take it all in stride uh, because there's a, there's an imbalance there as as there would be, and that ties in with my video about the global. Uh, propaganda network that Israel runs and, and that's how they're able to create these sort of uh, bizarre um, um, rationales but uh, anyway uh, now that I've gotten that out of the way let's get into uh, where this racism comes from in Israel and um, when you go through early Judaism and you can find examples in the uh, Old Testament but also in the Talmud and uh, this is where racism is codified and in the Kabbalah and early Jew, uh, Judaism and uh, Jewish mysticism, um, they're uh, very strict and uh, there's a lot of kinship between uh, how early Judaism uh, evolved and, uh, and Islam. They're equally strict and they're equally uh, um, uh, intolerant to, to a degree of other religions. It's very blatant in uh, early Judaism, unfortunately. Uh, everyone who is a non-Jew, of course, is a infidel and a threat and uh, has a, a, a soul less than a cattle and uh, and I want to preface this by saying that in, in uh, a lot of circumstances like even with the Palestinians uh, the Muslims are not racist so much against Jews because they've grown uh, their, their cultures have grown up uh, in that region for thousands of years and they've lived in peace until the immigrants got there it, it, it is about like uh, everyone else and myself included it's about Zionism and it's about uh, the, the state of Israel. It's not about Jews. So the Muslims aren't quite as racist about uh, Jews as the uh, uh, Jews are about the Muslims in that region. Uh, although I'm sure, certainly, that's uh, probably changing. But uh, 15 million Jews around the world, 16, 6 million, uh, 6 million of them live in Israel. And uh, the, the, uh, Early Judaism, some of the laws were strict enough that if anyone uh, was to strike a Jew, uh, they were to be executed, uh, especially if they were a non-Jew. And um, 
and uh, one of the uh, frictions that was caused uh, for Jewish presence in a lot of uh, uh, Europe in um, the uh, 18th and 19th century and before was the, the host state was used to enforce uh, strict Judaism um, and uh, uh, the rabbis had a, a lot of uh, power, in fact dictatorial power to run these communities and uh, people were even executed and arrested um, for not conforming to the strict Judaism run by these rabbis and uh, so there, there's an inherent amount of racism uh, built into that sort of system uh, very insular uh, culture as we know uh, to this day a lot of uh, Jewish enclaves are still concentrated in different capitals around the globe and uh, so and then it caused a a problem, as I pointed out, because the these host governments were were used to enforce uh, these laws by rabbis, and that created an uncomfortable situation. And, and this goes all the way back to uh, early uh, Judaism, as we know. Uh, it was rabbis who called for uh, Jesus to be executed. It wasn't the Romans. Uh, the Romans were uh, willing to be uh, lenient in that situation. So it's a, a persecution of the rabbis. Essentially, a, a lot of anti-Semitism uh, uh, and backlash had to do with uh, persecution of the rabbis, uh, by the rabbis, and, uh, and not specifically the Jewish people. But I, I'm going to try and keep it simple because I want to keep this uh, video uh, short. So, uh, so we had a, a split in the Jewish community, and some embraced the Enlightenment and moved in a more secular direction. And so we had this dynamic caused between the, the Hasidic uh, fundamentalist uh, Orthodox rabbis and this new uh, post-Enlightenment culture, and, uh, which was a little uh, less of it, had a little less of an impact in Russia and Germany. And that's one of the reasons why problems with Jewish culture uh, are so dynamic there. And it also becomes a, a battle between communism and capitalism, uh, Jew, Jewish culture is uh, so associated with capitalism in modern society now, but uh, historically and traditionally, they've been associated with communism. And that's why we, we see this uh, mix of uh, the threat of Jewish, uh, Jewish culture and Bolshevik culture. Uh, that's one of the things that Nazi Germany certainly railed against. So Zionism, uh, uh, this new philosophy, developed to respond to this new secularism to uh, re- confirm uh, the power of the rabbis. And the, this whole theory of Zionism seems to have developed around uh, 1861. A book came out called Quest for Zion. And the, the idea of reclaiming the Holy Land was born. And uh, so then we had a, a split uh, between the Orthodox Jews and native Palestinian Jews who were also against Zionism. And that's another interesting thing about the uh, birth of Israel is the fact that even the the immigrants who were coming to Israel were being rejected by uh, uh, native Jews that lived in Palestine because they knew that it would spoil the peace that they'd known for a couple thousand years living with Muslims. And uh, so we, we find that uh, the Zionists actually uh, persecuted Jews uh, along with uh, Muslims uh, when they came to Palestine. And uh, we, st we still see that uh, persecution of uh, outspoken Jews who uh, criticize Israel and Zionist policies. And uh, so uh, there's even documented cases of uh, these people being murdered, as, as one would expect. And uh, the Arabs and Jews had lived in peace, actually going all the way back to the 11th century. And uh, so we, we had this uh, connection between Zionism and Marxism, and in fact, a lot of... Uh, uh, wealthy Jews started uh, contributing to this uh, Zionist movement and then and, uh, buying up land. With, and, and then the, 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 all the Arabs would be ex, uh, expelled. And certainly this is, has a, a racist under, uh, undertones and overtones for that matter. Interestingly enough, uh, doing the research, it turns out that Theodor Herzl, who uh, was the father of mo modern Zionism as we know it, is actually an atheist. So he had no uh, religious uh, uh, skin in the game, he was interested in politicizing Judaism and turning it into a political movement and creating this Jewish state. So that's another uh, interesting aspect 
of the creation of Israel and he used, utilized religion to promote this political movement. And it, it ended up being a, a compromise between capitalism and socialism and uh, cre in the creation of a capitalist welfare state. And, and, and actually the Soviet Union uh, early on was a, a supporter of Israel because they thought it would become a new socialist state. But uh, it's explicit about genocide and expulsion of the very uh, Zionist documents, uh, which I, once again, I will not go into a lot here because I want to keep this short, but uh, it's very explicit that the Arabs will be expelled by any means necessary, which is an inherently uh, racist uh, colonial uh, ideology, and it's baked in the cake with Zionism from the very beginning, and uh, that's this, what still drives Israel, so we see this racism and uh, this knowing there was never going to be a two-state solution, knowing that there was going to be an expulsion and genocide of all the Arabs that were living there. Um, so so let me get back to the, the story. So uh, part of the birth of Israel is, of course, has to do with the, the Balfour Declaration. That's at the very heart of where we are now. And um, this uh, Balfour Declaration was created because the... Uh, Germany was essentially winning the war, World War I, and uh, the only way the outcome could be changed and, and the war continued was to get the United States involved. And one way to get the United States involved was to get the Jewish bankers uh, worldwide uh, to uh, prod and create a situation where um, their influence would be used to get the United States into World War I, which, of course, is what they did. And uh, part of the arrangement for that was what's uh, known as the Balfour Declaration. And uh, in uh, 1917, and this is interestingly enough around the same time as the Sykes-Pico Agreement, uh, which would later divide up uh, ex-Ottoman Empire uh, countries, including it, the area of Palestine, and create these uh, false borders uh, that we're still dealing with today. But let me get back to the Balfour Declaration in 1918. Uh, uh, the Arab response to Balfour, or well, let me first say that, um, let's see if I have it. Oh, the Balfour Declaration, and it declares that uh, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So that was an agreement uh, set up by uh, the Rothschilds and Jewish bankers that, uh, the, uh, that Britain would promise to create an Israeli homeland in Palestine. This is in 1917. So let's remember that because it turns out that Israel is not created as a result of the Holocaust. It was actually a result uh, created as a result of the Balfour Declaration much, much earlier. So it was part of a, a much, much bigger plan. And uh, so then the, uh, the Arabs responded, and they said that uh, to the Balfour Declaration, because the Arab world is uh, more than familiar with this document. Most Westerners don't know about it. Uh, so they responded and said, quote, We always sympathize profoundly with the persecution of Jews and their misfortunes in other countries, but there's a wide difference between such sympathy in the acceptance of such a nation ruling over us and dis disposing our affairs, unquote. So right off the bat, the inhabitants, uh, that many people out there who have gotten uh, Israeli propaganda think that the Palestinians were never there. Well, clearly they're there in 1917, realizing their nation was going to be taken away from them and given to someone else, and they would be their, uh, their rulers. And uh, even President Wilson actually rejected uh, the Zionist state. But uh, it was already baked in the cake with the Allies. And uh, he, in 1919, uh, after the first Arab protest of uh, settlers, uh, Balfour said, quote, we, don't, we do not even propose to consult the inhabitants of the country. Zionism, good or bad, right or wrong, is much more important than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who presently inhabit Palestine, unquote. More uh, confirmation that uh, there was people there in Palestine, that the, the English and everyone else who got involved in this, and the Zionists all knew they were there, and that uh, didn't really matter. Zionism was now 
part of the plan, and there was not going to be any consultation with the people who were already living there. So uh, once again, clear uh, evidence that there was a Palestinian population there, in spite of what um, a lot of people have been saying. So, uh, so anyway, we have uh, uh, rich Jews uh, work with European governments to support the movement. I interestingly enough, it wasn't the the wealthy Jews in Europe who were actually quite comfortable until uh, uh, Nazi Germany came along, and uh, so a lot of the the settlers who ended up going to uh, Israel were actually poor uh, socialists uh, and more militant uh, from uh, Russia and some of more, some of those regions, Poland, Poland, and uh, and they also had a, a much higher degree of uh, religious zealotry, and uh, and also brought uh, an inherent racism uh, that, like I say, is spelled out clearly in uh, early Judaic literature and is also spilled out very clearly in the Zionist documentation. And there's not enough room here for me to talk about all the quotes, um, although I'll try and uh, put some together to attach to this video uh, on some of these quotes uh, from uh, prominent Zionists that make it very clear that uh, racism is a very big part of this development. So, um, and then it, uh, so, and also imagine how a lot of these Arab uh, communities felt in that area, particularly Palestinians, that they finally get the Ottoman Empire yoke thrown off. Uh, and then have to deal with the colonial powers of uh, France and Britain. And then after that, they get these massive uh, uh, Jewish uh, settlement taking over their country. So we're talking about adding insult to injury. And uh, Abraham Kook, a good name for him, who was the chief rabbi of Palestine from 1920 to 1935, said that, quote, the difference between a Jewish soul and souls of non-Jews all of them in all different levels is greater and deeper than the difference between a human soul and the souls of cattle, unquote. I would suggest that qualifies as being as racist as anything ever said. And of course, when they're talking about non-Jews, they're talking about everybody, Christians uh, and Muslims alike. So uh, so then we have uh, um, the 1936 Arab up, uprising that lasted about three years against British and the Zionists. And uh, the British crushed it and, and over 5,000 Arabs died. So the, the pattern for seeing a very disproportionate uh, body count has been with the Arab population there for quite some time. And uh, between 1917 and 1947, the Jewish population went from 8% to 30%. Uh, but they owned less than 6 of six percent of the land. So think about that in 30 years of the population increase uh, from eight percent to thirty percent. Uh, no wonder there was uh, multiple Arab uprisings and violence continues these people poured into. And, uh, and then uh, in 1947 the UN gave 56 percent of the land to Israel and the plan was rejected because it, let's realize that, that they only own less than 6% of the land, why would they be get, being given 56% of the country? And, uh, but uh, to get back to um, this whole uh, uh, racism theme, uh, then we have, of course, the early terrorism of the Zionists. And, and a lot of people uh, misunderstand and think the Arabs were the ones who invented uh, terrorism. But, of course, it has uh, precedence uh, in many different parts of the world and, and uh, it's been used in many different situations, but the fact is, in this arena, uh, we have a, the birth of terrorism can be credited to uh, Jewish terrorist groups, and uh, a lot of the heads of those Jewish terrorist groups, who later became prime ministers of Israel, uh, are very proud of bragging uh, that they invented terrorism, and that includes the uh, uh, Der Yassin uh, uh, massacre, where there was executions, rapes, and body mutilations. And, um, and a lot of this is, is planned out. Uh, there's a, a plan, which I'm, I'm going to do a separate video on, on the plan Dalit, uh, which calls for the expel, uh, expulsion of Arabs using uh, massacres and terrorism. Um, so once again, this uh, racism has been an inherent part of uh, uh, this, the entire birth of, of Zionism and the entire birth of the state of Israel continues to permeate it. Um, and, and most unfortunate, once again, and uh, let's remember that uh, during this period of uh, Israeli settlement occupation, uh, the underlying racism and over racism is uh, one of the the ideologies uh, 
that allowed um, these settlers to, to raise over 500 villages and uh, clear out 11 urban centers of all Arabs and uh, 700,000 uh, Arabs expelled from their homeland. And uh, to keep it in perspective, in the U.S. that would be um, 200 million people moved from one part of the country into a reservation and over 1 million killed. So quite an impact on the culture of that region. And in fact, since 1946, Palestine has lost 75% of its original territory. And, uh, and they both have their, their um, focal point, and the Holocaust is in the collective Jewish mind in Nabka, or the day of mourning when Israel de declared uh, an independent state of Israel, uh, which uh, served to negate Palestine. That is in the collective Arab mind. And uh, Israel is a, is, is a theocracy, just like its Islamic neighbors. So that's something to bear in mind that uh, we have what a, a ostensibly is a, is a religious state that is actually a, a political state with a, a political quasi-religious uh, ideology. And, uh, and uh, so they're, they have this kinship with the, the governments around them. That's something to think about. It's not... It's only a liberal democracy for uh, the, the the chosen few. Uh, it's a it's a it's a theocracy uh, and a radical uh, theocracy, uh, much like the Islamic governments that they're so critical of. And um, the uh, the really hardcore uh, statements about uh, this inherent racism that, that I've tried to talk about the roots and a lot of this material comes from a Stephen Molinoy. A video that's quite excellent. I borrowed heavily from that and hopefully condensed this down to a little more uh, user-friendly version. Um, but uh, we have a, a quote from a book uh, from 2009 by an Israeli rabbi called The King's Torah. And he says in there, quote, there is justification for killing babies if it is clear that they will grow up to harm us. And in such a situation they may be harmed deliberately and not only during combat with adults, unquote. And one might think that's a lone radical voice uh, in the wilderness uh, of uh, Jewish literature, but it is not. This book has had uh, a lot of attention. It's got a lot of uh, accolades, and a lot of these ideas uh, show up again and again in um, other documentation uh, by prominent Israeli uh, uh, military personnel and government leaders. And, in fact, there's a booklet from the Central Regional Command around the same time, and it says that, quote, when our forces come across civilians during war, so long as there's no certainty that those civilians are in, incapable of harming our forces, then according to the Hala, Halakba, they may and even should be killed. Under no circumstances should an Arab be trusted, even if he makes an impression of being civilized. In war, when our forces storm the enemy, they are allowed and even enjoined to kill even good civilians, that is, civilians who are ostensibly good, unquote. So just proving that the, the, the racist uh, uh, thread that runs through uh, all of this uh, society and runs through their military machine and runs through their literature that runs through their uh, political ideology and their government leaders. Um, so it's, uh, as I brought up in the previous video, that the UN found that this kind of racism uh, permeated uh, Israeli culture on every level, and uh, uh, I'm talking about the fact that this has its roots going all the way back to uh, the Talmud Torah. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It goes back to a uh, dictatorial uh, uh, rabbinical culture, rabbi culture, and um, and then the creation and uh, juxtaposition of a political ideology onto this uh, religious intolerance and racism. Uh, Zionism, which makes uh, makes racism baked into the cake with Zionism. All the literature from the Zionist movement uh, bears this out uh, page after page, quote after quote. And um, that's just the way it is. And once again, I'm not trying to pick on Israel. I'm just uh, showing the reality of uh, what we're dealing with. I want things to change in my country, the United States, and since a lot of my money goes to Israel and uh, a lot of... Uh, American treasure and blood goes to Israel, and because U.S. foreign policy is dominated by Israel, I want to see changes in Israel as well. And I know a lot of Israelis do as well. Uh, they have to deal with an extreme right-wing government right now, 
that uh, continues to foster this uh, kind of racism, uh, just as uh, I live in this country where I have a government that fosters a different kind of racism. So, uh, so anyway, there, uh, there we have it. Uh, just a, a, an overview, uh, much longer than I, I, I had intended, but there isn't any way it could have been shorter. And uh, hopefully this uh, will make, uh, make this uh, clear. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and say goodbye now to a couple more survive, uh, subscribers who are going to leave now. I'm useful idiot. Don't you be one too.